Многие спикеры сегодня выступают в первый раз. У нас сегодня много чего в первый раз, поэтому попрошу любить и жаловать. Вот. Мы начнем с Джорди. Джорди были э, веселые выходные, он уже у нас тут два дня, поэтому как бы, он уже любит Одессу. Вот. Джорди, it's your turn, but, uh, one, but one second, please. No? Okay. Uh, Jordi is here in first time. Uh, wish him good luck. Let the force be with us, yes? Thank you, Jordi. Come. Thank you. Oh, that's it. Oh, no. Thank you. And hi. And okay, I'm gonna try to not have echo in the microphone and not be in the way of the screen, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, welcome uh, to the conference. Well, I guess he said that. I don't know. I, I don't speak Russian very well. So. Um, okay, so let's talk about Composer. Uh, everyone used Composer already? Just to make sure, yeah, everyone is awake, good, okay. Um, so what I want to do today um, is give you a, a short project history of, of Composer, like really quickly, um, then try to go over some, um, some code and, and like project management kind of things I learned over the, the last six years. Um, because I, I think some of them, well, they might be interesting just to just to know, um, and some of them also I think they apply to like your your day-to-day -day jobs maybe as well, and and just other projects and not only composer. So hopefully you you'll find something interesting, and um, and anyway we'll have a lot. I think we have quite some time for questions afterwards. Um, so let's dive into the, this short history. So uh, it all started in 2010, I think. Um, I started working on the on the Symphony 2 project back then, and then in 2011 we realized that Symphony 2 was coming to be stable, and we needed something to install the plugins, and like so we started working on that. And at the same time, Neil Saderman, which is the the other guy that that uh, started Composer. Uh, he was working at, on PHP BB, and they had the same problem that they needed uh, a plugin installer. So we just decided to to work together on this. Oh, that's um, so. I think we discussed this at the conference in February, and then like a few months later in April 2011, we had the first commit. So as you can see, it's now yeah, a little bit over six years old. So that's quite some time to work on a project. I mean, in IT, like six years is quite a long time. Um, it took us a few months until we had like packages ready and, and started publishing packages. And then after like what what's that eight eight months more or less we already had the first thousand packages which is I think is quite impressive like it 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 grew really quickly and like one year after that we had ten thousand which is also like like the growth was just insane uh, now we are at hundred forty five thousand hundred fifty thousand so that's a lot of stuff out there like. <laughs> Not all of it is useful, I think. But <laughs> um, then in, in June 2014, I realized that this was taking a lot of my time, and I needed to find a way to make some money with this, because otherwise it's just like evenings and weekends, and there's only so much time you can do this without like going completely crazy. So I, I started this uh, Torrent Proxy project, which was kind of a, a private package hosting thing. Um, and I was trying to sell licenses for that. And that worked a little bit, but not so well. Uh, so last year, we, we started working together with Niels uh, on this, this new one, uh, which is Private Packagist, which we launched in December. And this is kind of the same principle, but uh, built from the ground up and, and like hopefully a bit better. So uh, check it out if you haven't. Um, 
Then, uh, okay, let's just dive into the code learnings. So, oh, that's really, it's very hard to read, but it's okay. You don't have to read the, the little fine print. Um, what I just wanted to highlight there is, um, so this is the code that scans the, um, for classes. So if you do for the autoloading, we have you know different methods. We have this PSR0 autoloader, PSR4 autoloader that are like standard based on the path. And then we have this class map autoloader and that just goes into every file and it tries to find which classes are in that file. And so if you think about it, like the obvious way to do this would be to use this, um, this token get all function because that gives you, like it passes the file and it gives you a, an array with all the tokens and you can loop through that and find, okay, if there's a class token followed by a name, that's the class name. Easy. That's like three lines of code or something. Um, the problem is when you have a project like Composer that needs to run on everyone's machine and everyone's project, you end up finding a lot of edge cases, like really, really weird stuff sometimes. Um, like this pretty quickly failed because uh, we had people with like 10 megabytes files, like just, you know, a 10 megabyte PHP file, which is a lot. Like. <laughs> And that was just like, I don't know, a lot of data inside their class or, you know, just the embedded data or something. And so when you do a token get all on that, it passes the whole file and memory limit explodes instantly because you try to allocate like five million tokens or something and it just instantly fails. Uh, so that would just crash Composer every time you try to run the autoloader on this, which is not good. So we had to do it the long way instead, uh, with regular expressions and like trying to parse the file and remove this and remove that until we know for sure that there's only some valid class thing in there and then we can try to match for, for classes. But then, you know, that's not the easy way, like you have to... You have to remove uh, strings and comments and everything. Otherwise, you might have a word like class followed by something in a comment, and you don't want to pass that as the, the actual class name. Um, so yeah, that's just to highlight that w when you have a big project that needs to run everywhere, like usually the, the easy way is not quite working. Like, there's always someone with a bug somewhere. And anyway. <laughs> Then um, memory optimization, I heard that, you know, uh, this might be a question that comes up, so I thought I, I will just talk about it before someone asks. Um, so, I mean, that's been a problem since day one, I think, like, just the amount of memory that we use is a lot. And, yeah, people usually ask, like, oh, wait, when, when can it get less memory and so on. Um, so we did a lot to improve that already. Um, that's one of the examples. Like, so that's uh, the, the, the rule class. And that's used, what is that? I don't know. Uh, probably some notification or something, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Um, no? I don't know. Well, anyway, so we'll see if it goes away or not. Um, the, um, maybe it's the screen, huh? So it's a lot of different screens back there that are all plugged together. There's a lot of cables and... <laughs> ah. If someone can say in Russian that it's working now, because... I don't know. <laughs> Okay, he has to stay there or the whole conference, I think. <laughs> okay, anyway, I'll just keep talking about this. Um, so the, this rule class, that's what happens is when we solve the dependencies, so you have this kind of, uh, it's not really a tree of dependencies, more like a multi-directional graph of dependencies with all the dependencies of other dependencies and so on. Um, so when we load the, the packages, like a... I don't know, let's say you take the Symfony framework, you, 
you load up, you have like uh, 200 versions of the symphony framework and you know, you have version 201, 202, and so on and so on. When you load that up, you have to say to the solver, you have to create one of these rule objects for every version to every version saying, okay, if you install version 201, then you cannot install version 202. And you also cannot install version 203, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you quickly see how this explodes like into millions of objects like pretty easily. Um, so, like in PHP 7, this got a lot better because, uh, like, the, the the memory required to to create one object, like to allocate one object, is very very little, like compared to how it was in PHP 5. Um, but you still, like, when you have millions of them, it still becomes quite big. So, what we did there was uh, to just compact. Like, we had we had uh, we had a few a few memory fields. A few a few properties on the on the class, and we put them all into this one bit field that you see on line five, um, and just like using you know uh, those bitwise operators, you can basically like put the three different values into one integer value. So uh, that's one way to save some memory. I mean. That's the other problem with PHP is uh, just a property like that with with. Um, it's like an integer is not just like one byte for the integer or like two bytes for the integer because you have this uh, this z val like the or z val or uh, that's like this zend engine value internally right um, and this holds the it holds your value is the, the integer and it also holds a type so to say okay there's this value and it has type integer and that's the value and so in the end you end up having like I don't remember the exact number but it's something like 10 or 16 bytes uh, per variable or per property or so. So there like going from down from, from 3 to 1 you already save like uh, you know you don't save just the two integers you save I don't know like maybe 40 bytes or something. Um, Time a few million, it makes a difference. Um, but yeah, we, we already tried quite a bit to improve this, so I'm not sure how much more we can we can really improve. Um, somewhat related to that, we have uh, garbage collection. So in PHP 5.3, uh, they added this garbage collector, and that's overall it's a good thing. But for Composer, that's a very specific use case that we found out at some point that if you disable it, everything runs like twice as fast. It's really like a big, big difference. And like some people looked into the, the, the garbage collection code and figured out that the reason it happens is uh, like every time you, you create, I think it's somewhere around 10,000 objects. Then he thinks, okay, there was a lot of stuff happened, so probably I should run the garbage collector to check if anything can be collected. So every time you create 10,000 objects, it goes through all the objects and checks that everything is still referenced and there's nothing that can be removed. Problem is, again, if we think back to the other slide and you allocated a million objects very quickly and you always need them because they're all referenced, then every 10,000, this checks everything. And this, this check actually requires some time, and so disabling the check actually makes it run really a lot faster. So now we just disable the garbage collection before we run the, the solver, and it goes like CPU, CPU crunching for like a few seconds, and then we just enable it again. Um, however, like I would say, do not try this at home, like don't do this in your projects, because unless you have a very, very, very good reason to do it, it's generally, like it, it works well the way it's done, I think. It's, it's just like Composer is a very specific use case there that, that kind of breaks it. So yeah, don't, don't go at GC disabled to every project, it's not gonna help. Um, okay, networking, this one of my pet peeves, uh, it's very interesting. So when I, when I first started looking into the, the whole Composer stuff, I, I looked at Pear. I don't know if anyone remembers Pear. Yeah, 
a few old people, uh, <laughs> old developers. Um, so uh, when I looked into pair, I saw that all the network stuff, like all the HTTP requests, were done using FSOC Open, which basically just opened the socket to a server and then they re-implemented the entire HTTP protocol in PHP. Like they were not using any of the of the HTTP streams in PHP and so on, like none of that. So I thought that's kind of like that's that's really absurd. Like this code is old and nah, it's nonsense, and you know, let's just do it better, and that's gonna be great. Now it turns out, a few years later, I kind of understand <laughs> why. <laughs> you know, that's usually how it goes. Um, we didn't quite go as, as low level as we're implementing all of HTTP, but we have quite a lot of, of things in there to, to go around problems. Um, so one thing we have is this uh, Composer CA bundle package. Uh, that's basically used to um, uh, to find the, the, this uh, CA bundle on, on your file system, wherever it is. Uh, so that's the certificate authority bundle, which is used to, to verify the SSL certificates. Right? So that's like contains all the all the root certificates, and then you can check against this list uh, if it's valid. The problem is PHP by default didn't use to know where this file was. Uh, you could configure it, but most people don't, and then like. Uh, just on average, it was impossible to do a SSL properly if you don't know where this file is because you cannot verify the certificates. And if you can't verify the certificates, then SSL is kind of useless. Um, similarly, for, for just like fetching the certificates, we had issues with uh, PHP 5.3, 4, and 5. Uh, that they don't always, they are not always able to to retrieve the the certificate from the server correctly. Um, so in this case, we actually have to open a connection without verifying the certificate, so we can read the certificate and then like pass it and then do the next like the the real request with uh, with SSL enabled and the actual certificate so you can check like it's, it's just hell like it doesn't make sense i guess the way i explain it but it's definitely more complicated than it should be um we also have to manually handle the redirects because of that because since we force the certificate then we have to check that the next request is on the same domain because if it's another domain then we can't force the same certificate, we have to fetch a new one. So lots of fun again there. Um, we have to check the content length header versus what we got back. So you have the response and you have the content length header. You would think that this is fine if, if PHP tells you, hey, I got the response, you know, it should be good. And yeah, it's usually it's good. But sometimes, uh, just depending on the way that the server might drop your connection, then PHP thinks, oh, it's okay, I got a response, and it's a 200 okay, no problem. But actually, it's cut in the middle. And then you try to use that, and nothing goes well. So we actually have to do those, those checks uh, ourselves. Um, we have gzip handling as well because we transfer a lot of JSON, so you want to compress that because uh, uh, like JSON compresses pretty well. It's usually like uh, around 10 times smaller if you if you have uh, the, zip, the zip extension enabled. Uh, but again, like there is some weird bug in PHP 5.3 that you know uh, it's just sometimes on some gzip requests it doesn't work if you use the this uh, zlib decode function on top. But if you do it via this stream hack, then it's fine. So it's like it doesn't make any sense. Thankfully, this was fixed in PHP 5.4, so I think someday we can clean up this code and just have the the one line that works. But yeah, it's uh, again like if your code needs to work everywhere, you're gonna have problems um, and very interesting problems sometimes. Uh, yeah, that's one of my favorites of like what the hell were they doing? Is Bitbucket? If you try to download zip file and you're not authenticated, it just doesn't return a, an exception or like an error page. It just returns you HTML with a login page, you know, because you're trying to download zip file. 
with <laughs> so clearly you want a login page as HTML. Uh, I don't know why, like it, I guess it makes sense in the browser, but when you use the API with a programming language, you don't want HTML back when you expect a, a zip file, so not very useful. Um, but yeah, we have to check for that. When we download from Bitbucket, we have to check. Is this HTML or is it actually a zip file? Uh, so yeah, the, the, as I said, like this was really not easy with the whole SSL stuff. It got fixed a lot. Like uh, Daniel Lowry, I think is his name, he worked on that in PHP 5.6. Like he fixed a lot of issues there with uh, with SSL. So this, by default now, it works a lot better. So if you can ignore any version that's older than that, which I think at this point for new projects it's okay to just go like PHP 7 plus and, and that's it. But um, yeah, so, so now it's a lot better and we, we probably can remove half of the hacks we have in there. Um, yes. Oh. Then, yeah, finally, um, we do a lot of like data imports for um, like GitHub and so on, you know, just loading all these composer JSON files and just hitting the, the GitHub API overall quite a lot, uh, especially from packages because we, we synchronize all the, all the packages that way. And um, like this, uh, I think, uh, like uh, originally, I thought, yeah, it's fine. You know, just do the do the synchronization when when we receive a notification from GitHub that there's a new new version or like new commit, we get notified. We just run an update of the package. Done. That works most of the time, but the problem is networks are extremely extremely unreliable and. Like either the network is failing, or the GitHub API might be failing, or you know, there's just so many things that can go wrong when you consider like the the, the internet as a whole, and you're trying to communicate between servers. Um, so there, we definitely learned something. And for for private packages, uh, we built it only with like background workers and and so job queues and so on. So when we get notified, we just start a job that runs in the background. If the job fails, it gets retried. Like it's it works a lot better that way uh, than if you're trying to um, to do it in the in the process directly. Um, yeah, because we, we also noticed, like, for example, GitLab, I think they're down, on average, like every two days, I would say, they have their API has some downtime. Because we know, because we, we see the errors coming through, and like when you call it all day long, you just notice, okay, oh, GitLab is down again, oh, GitLab is down again. It's, so you, you really can't trust anyone, uh, you can't trust any network, so if you do anything related to networks, like just use background jobs and, and make sure you can retry um, easily. Uh, that's another fun one, I think, uh, for FAR files. So we have this uh, composer.far, right? We package everything into one. And then one day, this guy, uh, like some security researcher guy, comes and asks me, "Hey, like, how comes that the the build is not reproducible?" He was like, "You know, if I if I rebuild the, the project from scratch, it should have the same hash at the end, right?" And like, if you build composer twice, the hash of the of the composer file is not the same. So he was like, how can I verify that it's actually the right content or that it wasn't hacked somehow in the middle if, if it doesn't match the, the hashes? So I looked into this and I fixed a bunch of things that we had like internally that we were doing and I thought, okay, I'm almost there. It's like everything looks the same now except for this uh, the far file signature. And it took me a while to understand what was going on, but in the in the far file format, you have like every it's it's kind of like a zip archive or a, or a tar um, where you you basically have this manifest on, on the beginning that says okay there's this file name is at this offset within the the archive so if you want to read this file just jump to this location in the file and so on. But it also has metadata about the file, so it has like the, the last modified time of the file, 
and and uh, the problem is the last modified time is always just the time that you build the file. So if you rebuild the file, all the last modified times update, the signature updates, and then the hash of the file it changes. So I had to build this package, uh, this far utils package, which basically then takes the far file and sets all the like just goes into binary editing it, uh, changing all the um, all the file last modified dates to be the date that you want. So you just give it a date and you say, okay, just put all the all the modified times to to be that date, and then it regenerates the signature and. And then at the end you have the same file with the same timestamps. Like this kind of stuff is not fun. <laughs> like it's just, I mean, it's it's fun from a <laughs> engineering perspective maybe, but uh, it's just a, a lot of wasted time. Um, but now we have we have those file files that are correct and like actually built every time the same. Um, another thing we did was try and decouple some some code or like well extract some code into into standalone packages uh, because that allows people to to reuse them and it also allows us to make sure that things are decoupled correctly because if everything is together it's easy to slowly have a mess between classes that reference each other and so on so like extracting stuff was was i think a good decision we should do probably a lot more but it's uh it's quite time consuming so not not so easy um, but yeah, what we have is, so we have this uh, CA bundle I explained already, uh, we have Semver, which is, I think that's probably the most useful for other projects to reuse, it's just all the version parsing and version comparison that we have, so you can just load that package up and if you have two version numbers you can easily compare and just do a lot of checks on them. Uh, we have this SPDX license package as well, which lists all the official license identifiers, like for the MIT license and so on. You have this uh, standard database, basically. Um, then there are a few more, like JSON lint. Uh, that's also something that's, that's pretty interesting, I think. Um, that by default, if you do JSON decode and the JSON is not valid, you just get null, right? So that's okay. <laughs> there was an error, fine. Then you can call JSON, uh, what is it? JSON last error, I think, the function. And then it gives you a code saying it was this type of error. And if you look up the code, then it tells you there was a syntax error. And now you know there was a syntax error, but you don't know what. And that's really not helpful at all. Uh, so I, I had to port this uh, JSON linter from JavaScript to PHP, just so we can give like useful feedback to users. If you know you forgot the comma on line five, it's a lot better than just saying eh, syntax error. Figure it out. <laughs> Good luck. Um, it's the little things like that, you know, but it, it makes the user experience quite a bit better, I think, if, if when you get an error, you get a helpful message. Uh, so this took some time, but I think it's worth it, and I, I also use it usually in, in APIs, like if on other projects I, I, I work on. Um, I use it in APIs when we decode the JSON. If the JSON is invalid, then I decode it with this library, and I send back a, an API response that says invalid JSON and then the, the text with it. Because usually if someone sends you bad JSON to an API, it's because they're doing something funky and trying code on the command line or something and they messed up, so they will probably see the, the error message. So I think it's you know you can, something you can use uh, anywhere really. Uh, the CLI prompt that's used to do, yeah, that's another fun aspect of having a project that needs to run everywhere, is that includes Windows, for example. Um, uh, like, 
how many people that don't like working on Windows because it has all these bugs. I don't know. I work on Windows, so I made sure that everything runs fine on Windows. Um, but there are some some challenges for sure with with interoperability and so on. And so this this little library, it's like five lines of code that, and plus uh, an exe file that was compiled from five lines of C++. And all it does is it prompts you on the on the command line. It prompts you for a password, um, but without showing the characters. So when you type, it doesn't show the characters. Just records it and then gives you like to gives it back the password uh, internally. So this is something that's really easy to do on Linux. You just have this uh, this bash command that you can run and done. On Windows, it's somehow, if you don't have C++, you can't do it. <laughs> uh, so we had to do it the hard way. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, this file utils I mentioned already. Um, so on the other hand, we also reuse a lot of code. So we use a lot of uh, Symfony components. Uh, that's kind of because I was involved with Symfony, and so I, I knew it already. Um, but I would say like anything is fine, right? Just find a, a good library. It's definitely a lot better than um, than writing your own stuff. Um, like I think this saved us a lot of time. The one problem is Symfony is moving faster than than Composer can. So like Symfony 3 it requires. Uh, PHP 5.5 5 or 5.6, I'm not sure anymore. And now Symfony 4 will require PHP 7.1, I think. Uh, that's good, but the problem is Composer still needs to run on everything. So we're stuck on Symfony 2, where they don't include new features anymore. We just get like really old bug fixes at this point. Which is, yeah, it's okay, but um, I'm looking forward to, to drop the old versions as well. But the problem is since Composer needs to install any project anywhere, it kind of needs to run on most PHP versions that people still use. Um, so yeah, we'll see how long that takes before we can really drop uh, everything under PHP 7. Um, yep. Okay, let's go into the, the project management part. Um, so one big thing which I really want to like emphasize on is is this point saying like if you open a pull request to a project you're not just sending them code you're asking them to accept that code and then maintain it forever because like a lot of people they just send a pull request and then go hey why is this not merged yet and na 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 and, you know like faster faster free open source developers like. <laughs> Why, why don't you do work for free faster? Um, that, that's really a big deal. And like, like the, the bigger the projects become and the, the more complex and so on, you, you start to really think about this because, yes, like, you know, it's, I'm glad that you fixed some, some, pro some, some problem that you had, but if it's a problem that only like one person has and it adds like 200 lines of complex code that I'm not even sure I understand, I'm like, mm, do I really want to have this in and then I have to deal with it later when it breaks? Like, not really. So I think that's really important to keep in mind uh, when you interact with other open source projects um, that they might not accept things just because like, it, you know, you won't be there to maintain it forever. So if you want to commit to maintain it forever, that's another deal. If you tell me, okay, you know, merge the code, please, and I'll fix anything that happens with it, then we can maybe discuss. <laughs> but not a lot of people are ready to do that, I think. And it's also important to, to keep in mind, I think, if you, if you maintain a library yourself, like if you have an open source project, just don't forget this, because if you just accept anything that comes, then at some point you, you'll be in trouble, like, because it's, it's just too much work. Um, so one thing that, that we did to kind of fix that problem is having the plugin system. So when people send stuff that I don't want, I'm like, look, it's easy. You can do this with a plugin. Uh, so you do it yourself. It's in your repository. You maintain it. Not my problem. So that's, that was 
quite a good thing, I think, that uh, adding the plugin system really helped with um, just closing pull requests that I was not comfortable merging. Um, because, yeah, it just moves the, the responsibility. Uh, that's one, one good tip, I think, um, to, like, if, the, you know, you, t you tend to have a lot of support requests. I think that's quite common, like, when people get a bug or, like, something failed, they just fire up GitHub and go, hey, there's a problem, and they don't even read anything, they just help, help, help. Uh, so this quickly gets to a lot of work, uh, just answering people on GitHub, and that's not really productive. Like you, you know, you're helping someone, but this doesn't really bring the project forward. So um, I think like really focusing hard on bugs, and also like uh, I would say like user user experience issues. I would also say are bugs. Like if if someone fails to do something and they have to come and ask, and this happens like every week, you have it, you know, on this weekly basis, someone reporting the same problem because they tried to do the same thing and they couldn't. Um, not because it was impossible, but just because they didn't figure it out, maybe. And maybe that's a bug in your documentation, you know, or maybe you can add some some helper class to make it easier to do, or something like that. Like, and if you really try to identify those those uh, those problems and fix them uh, pretty aggressively, then I think you you reduce the the load on the support side a lot. And and this is also true, I would say, for any any website, right? Like if you have a web application and people always request the same stuff, then it's probably worth to, to actually look into it and make sure that this doesn't happen anymore because you have to pay this support team as well. And, you know, it's it's just costs in the end. If, if it's your time or someone else's time, it doesn't matter much. Um, so that, that's just an example, I mean, from a, it's not really user experience in a traditional website sense, it's more like command line uh, user experience, but just before we start Composer, we check if the temp directory is, is usable. Like, if, is it writable, and like, can you write something and delete it and, and read it again? Like, and the reason we do this is if the temp directory is not writable, you're gonna end up with some really weird bugs down the line. Like it's just, you know, it's not gonna fail always, but maybe this command in this condition will try to access the temp deer, and it will fail, and then it will fail in some weird way because you didn't expect this to fail, because it shouldn't fail. So you then have like some other thing failing completely strangely, and then people report an error message that doesn't make any sense. And you, you waste a lot of time like debugging why it's, why it's going on until they figure out, oh, actually my, my temp directory was misconfigured and sorry. And so you just wasted like half an hour debugging stuff for nothing. So this is like, you know, a few lines of code, but then it makes sure, okay, if the temp directory is not accessible, we put a big warning. So even if the user doesn't see the warning, which they should, but some people really don't look, but at least when you ask them, please paste the whole output, then you see the warning and you tell them, okay, temp directory, and you only spend 10 seconds on that instead of half an hour. Um, that's like kind of similar similar use cases uh, for, for kind of if, if there's a problem. So that's like what we do, well, some of what we do uh, if there's an exception. So if, if there's an uncaught exception in, in Composer, we do a lot of checks, uh, like, is the disk full? Because that's another funny one where, you know, oh, sorry, it, everything failed because my disk was full. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, so now we just check if there's less than 10 megabytes free, I think, we just say, hey, the following error might be due to the fact that your disk looks kind of full. Um, we have stuff for, for Windows there as well, where such as some, some people have some misconfigured something and it just makes funny errors. Um, uh, what's the last one? It's really hard to read from up close. Uh, oh yeah, that's um, if it failed to, to start a new process because it's also a pretty common error, like if you're out of memory, it fails to start a process. 
So there we say, okay, if we see this uh, failed to start process thing like in the early exception message, then we know it's probably due to that. So we say, okay, you know, this exception might be due to this problem. Go check this page, and there's a link to the to this um, troubleshooting page, which explains you a lot. Like if you saw this error, maybe it's due to that. So just helping people to to help themselves basically means that hopefully they will fix the, the problem on their own before they they go to the to the support. Um, similarly, when people ask you like for feature requests and so on, uh, or like they report bugs. I mean, bugs are, are kind of okay, but it's more when they when they want a feature. I would say like always try to understand really what they want because a lot of people they say you know um, well, I, don't, I don't I don't have a good example now, but. They just ask you for something which they think would fix their problem, but it's not really, maybe they don't ask you for what they want because they just cannot express what they really want because they don't know the product well enough or something. Um, so uh, this five whys technique, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's just you know asking why five times until you get to the to the root cause of like if you say okay like the the, the, the production server crashed, you ask okay why did it crash? And then you look oh looks like because it was the CPU was overloaded. Okay then why did was the CPU overloaded? Ah it's because the application was doing something stupid there. We have a loop doing a lot of queries. Okay then why are we doing this? And you know maybe you get to this root cause at some point that explains really the problem. And if you fix that, then you fix everything else. If you just fix the, the server by restarting the server, well, tomorrow it's going to crash again. Like, <laughs> so that's important for bugs, I think, but it's especially for, um, for features, you really want to understand like why are people asking for this like if if the the request doesn't make sense you just make sure you ask okay what are you trying to do like what don't tell me what you want the code to do just tell me what you as a person are trying to achieve and then we can see how to get there with the code because like sometimes people focus on a code solution without really thinking what like what problem they're trying to solve and uh, so yeah uh, and, and that's usually the thing, like, you have the overview of your project and someone else, they come and they see, okay, ah, there's this one class, I would like to change it to be like this, because that fixes my little problem. And, and it's probably right for them in this case, but if you, you look at the whole project and you see this change and it doesn't make sense to you, then try to figure out what it is they want and then maybe you can fix it better. Um, one last point, the maintenance really, if it's any kind of complex project, I mean, I have a few projects that are like kind of done, you know, they have to do a little fix like every year once, then it's okay. But this is pretty rare, I think. Like most projects, they just grow to become this thing that never ends. I mean, you probably know this from just your jobs, like, I think like, a project in IT is just never done, like no matter what it is. Um, but yeah, like in open source, it's exactly the same. Like people will come up with with new feature requests and, and issues and so on. Like this will be forever, basically. So, so I think uh, it's it's really important to keep this in mind as well and and try to make it sustainable and. Like this, uh, this private packages thing, like that, that was for me the thing. Like, okay, saying I can't spend weekends and evenings and like, you know, have day job and do weekends this, and then my girlfriend gets mad. So that's like, I can't do this forever. Like, I can do this for a few years maybe, but then at some point you need to somehow like make this more sustainable. So. That's really hard, I think. Like it took us ages thinking about this problem. Like, how do you somehow make money with open source? Like, it's really difficult. I've had this discussion with with hundreds of people, I think, over the years. Um, I mean, this this private packages. That's one attempt. We'll see if it works. But uh, 
I think it's important to consider if you want to start your own open source project, like I would definitely encourage you to do it. I think it's great. Like if you, if you don't have any open source stuff, go for it. But yeah, keep in mind that if it grows to be something big and like used by a lot of people, then you have to deal with the consequences and that's, uh, that can take a lot of time. So, uh, just to sum up real quick a few, a few points. Um, data imports, as I mentioned, I think they're, they're really hard. Like, a lot can go wrong. Um, if you add networking on top, it's even harder. So, if you can avoid it, avoid it. But if you can't, uh, just remember, like, maybe use job queues and so on. Um, user experience for me is essential. Like, be it you know, if it's a library, then it means user experience is like developer experience, if you want to call it that. Like, it's a developer that cannot use your library correctly, then that's a problem. Like, let's say it's a UX failure. You should fix those. Um, and just yeah, remember that that code is made for people. I think that's like some really important point that we tend to forget sometimes. Like, like either the code is built for people to fix a problem for people or it's built for other developers to read later and edit later. So like, all the code is about people really down the line. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, And Ребята. now we have 15 minutes for questions, yes? yes. Uh, Ребята, задавайте вопросы, я буду подходить, поднимайте руки. Кто будет первым? У кого есть вопросы? Just. And yes, just in case you want to look at the slides, they're, they're online at this address. And that's my Twitter if you want to send me a question later or something. Uh, but if you have questions now, it's good. Yes. I have two questions. First okay. one is... Uh, what is your strategy for testing Composer approach? Okay. And second one is, uh, what are typical use cases for private packages? Thank you. Okay. Um, so testing Composer, the strategy, I don't know if I would call, like, strategy is a big word for what we do, <laughs> I think. Uh, we just have PHP unit, like that's pretty much it. Um, Maybe something a bit unique that we did was uh, building this this kind of uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the PHP T stuff from from PHP internals. They're like um, it's like a full PHP file basically where you have a few blocks of code inside and you say okay I have this input and this code and I expect this output. So that's that's how they do a lot of the tests in for PHP itself. And that's something we got inspired from to to build this. Uh, um, so where we have a similar thing where we have uh, just one file with a few sections in it and you have a, a JSON file with like the composer JSON and you have uh, optionally you can have a log file and then you have the output and the output log file as well and so you can just I mean they're all optional but so depending on the test you can set up an environment kind of very small environment and make sure that the output is correct and like that that's really helpful I think uh, to have it in this format like in one single file per test with JSON and so on like it, there's a lot less boilerplate if you, if you try to do the same with PHP tests like as in like a PHP unit traditional test you can do the same but it's gonna be a lot harder to read I think so that's something maybe that's a bit special but otherwise it's really just a PHP unit um, other question, uh, private packages, um, the use cases are, like the, the, the basic use case we started with was really uh, private package hosting. So if you have like internal dependencies that you want to, um, to reuse between projects and so on, like we do hosting either in the cloud or on, uh, on premises as well. Um, but down, like what we're aiming for, let's say the, the longer term vision is to really help with uh, dependency management overall. So it's it's saying um, 
like helping you look at the dependencies of your projects and figure out if you have problems with those dependencies maybe like we, we want to add like uh, those uh, security vulnerabilities checks and so on um, also maybe checking for for project metrics like if, if something is not maintained anymore or like looks like it's not maintained maybe adding a warning because so what you get is um, you get uh, your list of private packages, but you also get the entire list of open source packages that you use. So it, it clones and like mirrors everything from, from packages.org into, into your own repository. So you see your little subset of the PHP ecosystem that you care about, like that you see everything that you're using. So we can really give you warnings and like information specifically for your projects and not just like overload of, of information for everything. So that's what we're aiming for. Like it's, we don't have everything yet. Um, but we're, we're working on new features now, so that's hopefully in a few months we have a, a lot more. Okay, that was two questions. Hi. Hey. Uh, you mentioned um, how uh, some of the older versions of PHP are causing problems for you. And um, I'd be interested to hear, because you kind of, <coughs> sorry, you kind of mentioned how eventually those would be, support for the very old versions would be dropped. Um, this is kind of an interesting uh, problem because, you know, even in the, in the WordPress world, they're, they're arguing about dropping support for 5.2. Yep. So Composer has it good. <laughs> but um, so I'd be interested in hearing um, what does it look like? Uh, what are you looking for as far as dropping support goes for the old versions? Like what percentages are you looking for? Um, mm -hmm. What's the cue for you to actually drop support? And then what would you recommend for people who still need that? Um, because other projects could benefit from that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, just maybe a quick show of hands, like who is still using PHP 5.3? Or like, let's just say all of PHP 5. Like in production, who is still on PHP 5? Okay, that's maybe a third, let's say half is those that didn't raise their hand. <laughs> uh, and of that, like, is anyone less than 5.6? So, f okay. So those you know, they are not maintained anymore, right? Like, so like PH, the PHP team does not give bug fixes anymore for PHP under 5.6. And I think 5.6 is being dropped next year, and 7.0 is being dropped this year, I think, as, as 7.2 is coming out. So, um, I think most people are updating pretty well. Like, uh, I, I would say, uh, I don't know if you've seen my blog post about the, the, the version usage. Um, like, you can just, uh, so if you go just uh, cell.be without the slides, uh, this is my blog post. I think the last article is actually that one. Um, well, I looked at the, the statistics of all the PHP versions that are used uh, by Composer users. So obviously this is completely skewed like to Composer usage, which excludes all of WordPress mostly because most WordPress developers are not using Composer. Um, and it also excludes a lot of other use cases, right? So it's, it's not representative of PHP as a whole, but it's representative for Composer, which is, is really what I, I care about in terms of dropping compatibility. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers anymore, but I think PHP 7 overall is like over 50%. So 7.0 and 7.1 is over 50%. Um, and then we have like 5.6 also still like 30% or so. And then a long tail of, of smaller versions. Um, but like 5.3, I think at this point is at like 0.5% or like something really insignificant. Um, so it's definitely not really worth it anymore, I think, to, to care about PHP 5.3. Um, so anyway, like just what we aim for, I think, is uh, doing some core changes uh, to the data format and so on that, that the communication with packages. 
and that would be like a version 2 of Composer and I think for that we'll just do these refactorings, keep it uh, 5.3 compatible just so everyone can upgrade and then when this is out just start working on version 3 that drops everything under 7. I think that's probably the best way is to say, okay, then we can clean up a lot of the code. Uh, most people, like, if, uh, by that point, I expect it's going to be like maybe 60, 70% of people will be on, on PHP 7. So most of them, they can upgrade easily to the latest version. But those that can't, at least they have something that will keep working like for a long time, I think. If, as long as we don't break the, the data transfer, let's say, between packages and Composer, there's no real reason that it should stop working. So I think we can do it pretty like gently in, in that sense um, without leaving anyone really too far behind, but without getting stuck with 5.3 either forever, because I don't want to end up in this WordPress style situation where we're like, yeah, this, this thing that hasn't been like upgraded for five years now, uh, we're still using it, it's good. Like, it's, mm. um, so I think that's that, yes. Any other questions? Еще вопросы есть у кого-то? Hi. Hey. Uh, first question about GPG uh, signatures. So, for example, mm -hmm. if you compare your composer with APT or DNF, mm -hmm. they can check the GPG certification and signatures. Are you going to implement something similar? Um, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it's something we've been discussing for years, I think, but it, it has a lot of problems um, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, like you, you need the, the, the a way to check the the keys right like that's always the issue with that is you need a key authority like a central key authority and then it's like well, who do you trust for that um, how do you exchange the keys and so on and then how do you trust keys at all and then there is the problem of like which I think is the main problem to me is even if we get all that to work well the issue is as soon as you have one dependency that is not signed the whole signature thing doesn't make any sense right like it's you're really bound to the weakest link in this kind of setup it's like your, your security is only as good as the the lowest like the least secure thing that you're using so can we get everyone to migrate and to start using gpg signatures for everything i'm not sure like maybe but sorry that yeah you could you could I, I don't know like i think it might happen but I, I cannot tell you when because it's it's a pretty hard problem like i think what we have now which is not too bad is we we flag the the git references right so all you install is based on the git reference and this cannot change really like if I mean, these days with SHA-1 clashes and so on, it might change, but it shouldn't change, then, generally speaking. Um, so if, if you rely on this hash, you at least should know that the code you installed on development, for example, will be exactly the same on production. If you have the, the composer.lock committed and you install from there. I see that it's not the same as really GPG signing all the code, but... <laughs> I don't know if it's worth it. Like it's it's a lot of work, a lot of trouble for migrating the entire community, and the, I don't know if the benefits are really that big. So yeah, that's <laughs> that's all I got. But we can discuss this more later if you want. I don't know what time it is, but still three minutes on my clock. I don't know if. Кто-то еще хочет задать вопрос? Нет? Есть еще? Okay, which uh, question Hello? was uh, most oh, interesting? Oh, yeah, I have to pick a question. Hmm. I don't know. I think they were all good questions. Uh, <laughs> this is difficult. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe the, the, the first one. Uh, who was, it was you, yeah? I'm not going to throw it. The question as well is, who fits in the ST shirt? 
<laughs> so I'm not sure. Like. <laughs> Давайте поаплодируем.